Genesis chapter 1. Such a wonderful chapter, I could read this again and again. I never get tired of it. But we're going to be looking at it from a different viewpoint tonight, so we'll read it again. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters and God made the firmament and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so and God called the firmament heaven and there was evening and there was morning a second day and God said let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good, and God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit which is in their seed, each according to its kind upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the cattle according to their kinds and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make men in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created men in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. 
And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. There was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God rested, God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. I have stood at a street corner in the city watching men with tightly rolled umbrellas and bowler hats scurrying to and fro, hoping to grab some little part more of the resources of the earth, and above them emblazoned in the stone of the Royal Exchange are these words, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. While they scurry about trying to get some more, one wants to say, Stop and read that. If we really grasped that text, it would solve a lot of our political problems. It would solve the problem of the Arab-Jewish tension in the Middle East. Who does that land belong to? The answer is it belongs to God. And therefore it belongs to whomever he gives the title deeds. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why is it his? Because he made it. And it belongs to him because... Unless he had spoken, there wouldn't have been a world at all. Now, last week we looked at what Genesis 1 says, said about God. And as long as we stick to that, science doesn't need to be brought into the picture because science cannot say anything about God. Science cannot examine God. And so no scientist could quarrel with anything I said last Sunday except on the grounds of his own opinion. But a scientist can neither prove nor disprove anything I said here. But when I come to speak about the world and men, then I'm afraid science does come into the picture because science does examine the world and it does examine men. And this is where the tension begins. Now, I did promise you this morning that if you came tonight, I expected you to work hard with the little brain box up here. The greatest unexplored territory in the world is underneath your hat. And indeed, we are given minds that we might stretch them and love God with all our minds. So I make no apology for making you think tonight. But the problem arises when you talk of what the Bible says about the world and about men. Because science apparently is saying some very different things about the world and about men. And unless you're going to live in compartments and keep your different areas of truth completely separate and believe one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday, which is impossible for the Christian, we must somehow tackle these problems. And tonight I promised you that I deal with the problem of did God create the world in six days? And if you're not aware of that problem, then you can take it easy for half an hour. But I'm very much aware of it. And I'm constantly asked about this. And I noticed that on one of the latest television programs in which Malcolm Muggeridge was asking the question, why about religion, that Professor A.J. Eyre, who's one of the most brilliant opponents of the Christian faith in this country, went immediately for the early chapters of Genesis. I said last week that Genesis is the basis of the Bible. Everything else is built on it which is why one would expect this book to be attacked more than any other book in the Bible. And so it has been. What is not always realized is that the attack on the early chapters of Genesis is not just confined to the last 100 years. I read this week a discussion of where Cain got his wife. The only thing is that the date of the publication of this discussion was about 1,600 years ago. And youngsters today come up with this thinking they've thought of something new, as if nobody had ever seen the problem before. And you will find that most of the questions that are discussed today about the early chapters of Genesis 
have been discussed in fact for at least 1500 years. Nothing new under the sun. But what is new is that the same questions are now being asked in the name of science. And that is new. And therefore we've got to tackle the questions. Mind you, I think that Christians have sometimes asked for it. And we've led with our chin, if you know what I mean. And we've really asked for someone to hit it. I mean, there was an Archbishop of Ireland called James Usher, who said that creation took place in the year 4004 BC. And he managed to get it into some of our Bibles. And if you've got a Bible that still has it in, then get another Bible. God never wrote that. There isn't a single date in Genesis until chapter 5. And he was a very naughty man to put that in. That's what I mean, leading with your chin. And he was followed a few years later by a man called Lightfoot, who was the Chancellor of Cambridge University, who said that you could pin it down closer than that, and that in fact the world was created between October the 18th and 24th in the year 4004, with Adam coming about 9 o'clock on the 23rd. <laughs> One of his critics said, being a careful scholar, he did not commit himself more closely than that. <laughs> well, now, when Christians say things that are not in the Bible, as if they are, then quite frankly, we are asking for it, and we deserve all we get. And I find this, that the clash, so-called, between science and scripture on these initial questions is often due to a misunderstanding of science and a misinterpretation of scripture. And I want to try and thread my way through these problems tonight. First of all, may I begin by saying two things about this planet on which we live and this universe in which we live, which Genesis 1 clearly states. The first is, or I could sum them both up in one sentence, that we live in an ordered world an ordered world. And that means two things. It means first that the world is the result of choice and not chance. And I want to say that again. The world is not the result of chance but of choice. Somebody decided to put it here. Somebody said let there be and there was. It isn't the result of some chance accident our little planet isn't the result of some terrific collision that took place between two stellar bodies by accident. The earth is here by choice and not by chance. You may wonder what that has to do with daily life, I'll tell you. That's why I'm studying the Bible and not the bingo card at this moment. Because I believe this world is not here by chance and that I'm not here by chance, and I am not going to pin my life to chance. The choice is simple. It is to live by Gad or by God. And Gad is the Hebrew word for luck or chance. And you either live by Gad and fill up your bingo card every Sunday, or you live by God and study your Bible every Sunday. If this world is the result of chance, then let's go to the nearest bookmaker. If this world is the result of chance, then the only hope I've got of got of living a good life is to fill in that pool and get 175,000 pounds. But if this world came by choice, then I'm here by choice. And my life must be pinned to that choice and not to chance. And that's why Christians don't pin their hopes on luck. So you see, this is very relevant to daily life. The second thing that follows from an ordered world is that this world is a cosmos and not a chaos. Let me take one little phrase out of Genesis 1, after its kind. Now this may sound a silly way of putting it, but pigs produce piglets and not puppies. And that means I can breed pigs. And water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and it doesn't freeze at that temperature and that's why I can make a cup of tea. And I, I live in an ordered world, a world in which there is not chaos, but a world in which there is wonderful order, and in which the order of Genesis 1 speaks to me of a God who knew what he was doing, who worked to a plan, and who has so ordered the world that science becomes possible. 
It seems to me an utter contradiction to say that the world came by chance, but somehow it's so ordered you can examine it scientifically. That's a contradiction in terms. If this world is open to mind, it must have come from mind. If I can see order in it, then it can't have come by chance. And so I would say that the very fact that science is possible makes it possible for me to believe in Genesis 1, and that the very ordered world in which we live is the result of God's mind speaking through his mouth and saying, let there be light, and there was light. Well, now that's all by way of introduction. But now we come to two specific problems which I'm going to deal with tonight. And at this point, we're going out of the three-foot end and we're plunging into the deep end. I hope you don't go in over here, but uh, I hope you'll be with me. First of all, there is the problem of where this planet is in space. And secondly, there is the problem of when this world began in time. Here are the two problems. As far as space goes, where are we? Not just where in the world are we, are we but where in the universe are we? And as far as time goes, when did we begin? Was it 4004 BC, whether it was October or not? Or when was it? Well, now let's look first at the matter of space. As soon as you do this, you find that apparently scripture and science say two quite different things. Scripture says this planet is the center of the universe. It's the middle of everything. Everything else is above us or below us, but we are in the middle. We are in the center. Or to use a word which the philosophers love to use, the Bible is geocentric, earth-centered. It regards this earth as the center of the universe. On the other hand, science tells us that it's nothing of the sort, that we are just a tiny little speck of stellar dust whirling around a sun and its system, which is itself part of a huge galaxy which you can see on a clear night, the Milky Way, which is only one of many other galaxies which are moving away at such a speed that our radio telescopes can't even catch up with their message, and that this Earth is not the center of the universe. Now, who's right? Is Scripture right that the Earth is the center, or is science right that we're just a little bit of dust whirling around somewhere on the edge of a galaxy? Who's right? Well, let's ask, what are we to do with Scripture if science is right? And I want to say straight away that I believe from their point of view that scientists are right and that the diagram in the Children's Encyclopedia Britannica which I looked at this afternoon in which our little Earth is almost disappearing off the edge of the picture in a maze of stars, that that is correct. What then are we to do with the Bible which puts the Earth in the middle? You can do three things. You can either say this language is mythological, in which you say that this is primitive man's idea and it is false and it is wrong and we can now scrap it, in which case you are saying the Bible is not the word of God and that it contains falsehood. Or you can say this is what is called phenomenal language, which means it is describing things as they appear to men. For example, we heard in our prayer and I would say exactly the same thing. The sun rose this morning. Now I know that it didn't. It was the earth that turned round. But why shouldn't I still say the sun rose? That is phenomenal language. It is how it appears to me. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not the final answer because, you see, that would mean that this was the word of man and not the word of God. Is there a further way? I say there is. And I would say that the language of the Bible which puts the earth in the middle of the universe is true, but is not mythological truth or phenomenal truth. It is God's truth. It is theological truth. And when we use the word theological, we mean this is how God sees it. Can I put it this way? Coming in on the A3 to Guildford, you'll see an AA sign which says, to the city, or sorry, to the town, let's get it right, to the town center. 
And you know, I took out my map yesterday of Guildford and I took out some mathematical instruments and I worked out where the centre of Guildford was and it's under the railway bridge in Stoke Road. <laughs> that is the dead centre of Guildford and not one of the AA signs points to it. They all point you down here somewhere in the high street. They're all wrong. Or are they? Can you see that both are true? Scientifically, the centre's under the railway bridge in Stoke Road. Personally and socially, the centre is in the high street because that's where everybody comes, that's where it all happens, that's where the shopping is, that's where the bus station is. Now, do you see what I'm saying? Scientifically, it is true that this earth is not the centre of the universe. Physically, it is true that it's not the centre. Theologically, this little planet of ours is the dead centre of the universe. This is where it all happens. This is where all the attention is. This is the only little planet in the whole universe that God's Son visited. This is where the cross was planted. And this is where the future of the whole universe has been settled. Everything happened here. The earth is the centre of the universe. And it's vital that we should hang on to this truth, especially in a scientific day. I've just finished reading the novel 2001, A Space Odyssey. And it's been made into a big spectacular film on Cinerama and showing in London at the moment. And here is a space novel which is written in the atmosphere in which man is pushing out into space. And what is the overall effect of the novel? That man is nothing. That this planet is nothing. We're just vanishing into insignificance in the space age. We're realizing how big the universe is and so how small we are. And this world is losing its significance. I want to say, thank God, the Bible still says the earth is the center of the universe. We need that truth. And it is true. And it is on this little planet of all the bodies whirling in space, it is on this little planet that God settled the future of the universe and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth that is to come one day. Now, can you see what I'm saying? I'm saying that science and scripture are both true. Both true. And if you're going to get the whole truth, you must have both. And in this day, when we are in danger of being bemused by science and all the reports of the infinite space out there, we need above all to get back to the Bible and discover again that when God looks at his universe, the earth is the center of it. If you go to the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, let into the marble floor, there is a silver star. And the guide will point to this and say, that is the center of the earth. Well, I'm sure Galileo would disagree with him. But Jerusalem, from God's point of view, is the centre of the earth. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying that there are different kinds of truth. And the Bible is concerned with much deeper truth than the truth you can measure with instruments. It's concerned with the whole truth about the world in which we live. Now, you may think I've spent a lot of time on this, but I've done so quite deliberately because I believe this is the answer not only to the problem of space which science raises, but to the problem of time in relation to the six days of Genesis 1. So let me now turn to the problem of time. Once again, we have an apparent contradiction between what Scripture says and what science says. Scripture says that the whole job was done in six days, under a week. The whole job was completed by then. Science says it took a million, million years. Science says it took two billion years for the first signs of life to appear on Earth. And that plants took a billion years. And that animals took 500 million. Now, there's a slight discrepancy here. <laughs> six days, less than a week, and billions of years. Who's right? Where do we find the truth? How can we explain it? Well, now, there are four possibilities, and I'll run through them straight away and then treat each one. Possibility number one, science is wrong, scripture is wrong. They're both wrong. Possibility number two, science is right and scripture is wrong. 
Possibility number three, scripture is wrong and science is right. Or have I got that mixed up? Have I said the same thing? I'll leave you to write it down if you're making notes. That scripture is right and science is wrong. And possibility number four, that scripture is right and science is right. Now let's approach these four. Take the first. Science is wrong and scripture is wrong. I'm not going to say anything about that because I've never yet met anyone who held this. Usually they've accepted one, and if they didn't accept either, I would wonder where on earth they'd get any other evidence from. So we'll drop that one. Number two, and I take this more seriously because there are many hundreds and thousands of Christians who accept this, that science is wrong and scripture is right. Now the first person I think to say this was a man called Price, but in our day two American uh, scholars, one a hydraulic engineer and the other a theologian called Whitcomb and Morris have produced books over the last five years which say this. If it's of interest to you, the Seventh-day Adventists hold this universally. That science is wrong and scripture is right and that all this dating and all these billions of years and all the geological evidence and all of that is all wrong and is another example of perverted human reason and that the Bible is right and that it was in less than a week. Now how do they line it up at all? Well in two ways. Some people try what's called the antique theory. Now I don't know if you know what this means but it means quite simply how old was Adam when he was created? You see the problem? If God created a man of 30, how old was he? He was only a few hours. If God created a tree and you immediately chopped it down and counted the rings in the trunk, how old would it be? Now, the antique theory suggests that God created genuine antiques. And that though he made them in only six days, that when you examined them, they looked billions of years old. Now, well, I don't think I'll take that much longer because I think it, um, it's ingenious but it's pure speculation. The other more serious charge that has been made against science is this, that in fact all the geological evidence which science has uncovered can be explained as the after effect of the universal flood in Noah's day which scattered the various fossils then compressed them into rock and so on. And this is why one of those gentlemen I've mentioned, who is a hydraulic engineer, has produced the book to show that the pressure of the water of the flood could produce the geological evidence. With the new radioactive methods of dating rocks, I honestly don't think, if I can pun, this holds water. So I come to the third possibility, that science is right and scripture is wrong that in fact the six days are a mistake. How then do we explain this language in the Word of God? Again, some people say it's mythological, primitive ideas, ideas that we now know not to be true and we can cut them out. Still others say that these six days were the days on which God showed this to Moses or that in fact God showed him creation in a kind of color slide show in which he saw something and then came blackness, saw something else, then came blackness and he then described it as morning and evening. Now I think these are all devices and must be seen to be such. So I come to my fourth possibility that scripture and science are both right. Now how could they be? Well either because they both deal with the same kind of truth or because they deal with different kinds of truth. Those who believe that they must deal with the same kind of truth, and I'll be through this difficult passage in five minutes. Those who feel that they deal with the same kind of truth, geological truth, have to find more time in Genesis 1 than is there. There are two ways of doing that. One is to make the days into ages. And many Christians have done that and said that the day in Scripture can mean a thousand years. After all, a thousand years is but a day to God and so on. And that certainly gives you more time. The trouble is it doesn't cope with morning and evening. And I think that's the most serious objection. 
The other way in which Christians have found more time in Genesis 1 is through the Schofield Bible, which was based on the work of Pemba. And that is to find in verse 2 a very, very long time in which a catastrophic event took place. And to see in the six days not creation but reconstruction of an earth that had got into trouble. Now again, ingenious though that is, it is neither true to scripture nor to science. And I personally cannot hold it. What then is the answer, or at least the answer that satisfies me? It is the same answer as the space problem. It is saying that here are two different kinds of truth which together make the whole truth. From the scientific point of view, millions of years, yes. But if you only listen to science, what conclusion would you come to? You'd come to the conclusion that the history of the human race doesn't matter that much. Let me put it visually for you. You've seen Cleopatra's needle on the Thames embankment, haven't you? Did you know that Moses used to look at that every morning? It was one of the gateposts from Pharaoh's university where Moses went as a student. But that's by the by. Now look at Cleopatra's needle. If the height of that needle represents the age of our earth, the history of the human race would be represented by a penny, not on end, but on its side, the thickness of a penny. And recorded history would re be represented by the thickness of a postage stamp on top. Now, how big do you feel? In all those millions of years, we are nothing. We've lost significance. So what does God say? I am assuming that God knew perfectly well how long it took him to make the earth. I am assuming that God cannot lie. I am assuming that Genesis 1 is the word of God and therefore true. I am assuming that God would know that we'd find out how long it took him. Why then did he say six days? The answer is because he wanted to tell us the whole truth. And when God looks at that time, it's a week, less than a week. And the important time for God is this little bit of history in which we live. So that all those millions of years are dismissed in half a page. And the history which we know and in which we live takes up three and a half million letters, three quarters of a million words and hundreds of pages. In other words, God is saying, I want to give you the truth about time as well as about space. Now, lest this approach to it is strange to you, let me ask you this question. When David met Goliath, which was the bigger man? Who was the bigger man, David or Goliath? Well, physically, with a ruler, Goliath. But in every other way, David. In courage, in character, in spirituality, in every other way, David was head and shoulders above Goliath. And you don't object to my using that phrase, do you? I'm giving you the whole truth about the situation. The mere physical truth would say Goliath was far bigger than David. But the spiritual truth is that David was far bigger than Goliath. And that's what comes out of the Bible story. And what I'm saying is this, that scientific truth by itself would tell you that in space the earth is nothing. And in time our little history is nothing. And God comes in and says that's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that in space you are the center and all my purposes are being worked out on your planet. And in time you are the center and the history of man is the most important period. And therefore he wanted us always to go on thinking of creation as less than a week's work. And the history of man and the years of an individual man as the most important thing in time to God. Now that is why I hope that people will never alter the Bible I hope they'll never try to say we'll have to bring it up to date and adapt it to scientific truth and evidence. I hope that we'll always keep God's perspective. I hope that we'll realize that to God, this planet and this period of history is the most important of the whole universe and that this was how he told us this. And so when you read Genesis 1, aren't you quickly through it? And I had to read at college scientific tomes this thick to tell me about how the earth began. God says, if you want to get the whole truth, you better get through that in a page and get down to real business.
that I made man as the crown and summit of my creation and that it's his history that I'm interested in. To me, six days work. Then I had a weekend's rest. But to me, the history of the human race is the important thing. In other words, we are dealing with different kinds of truth. But you'll never get the whole truth unless you get both kinds of truth. Let me move on from this. I do believe that this approach is easier to believe today for one very simple reason, that a Jewish man called Einstein, who understands God as Jews do, almost by instinct and in nature, it's bred into them. This man, Einstein, discovered the most amazing thing. In our era, he discovered that time was relative. It's interesting that it took a Jew to discover that, that it's not absolute, it's relative. And you may look at time from different points of view. I think that makes it much easier for us to say this. But I think, too, that in our day, it's more necessary than ever that we believe this. The novel 2001 begins with primitive animals fighting each other, and it goes through the centuries, and it goes through into the future and it whirls us around in space and time until you're lost in it. You don't know where you are and when you are. If you go to see the film, it will have the same effect. It simply finishes up with a psychedelic color sequence which is nothing more than an LSD trip without the drug. It just loses you in time and space. But the Bible comes in and says you are not lost. You are not insignificant. You belong to the center of time and space to God. You're the heart of it all. So you're necessary. One final difficulty and then I'm through tonight. And next week, God willing, I hope to talk about what the Bible says about men. I'm going to give you another little mental exercise, I'm afraid. Not Sunday morning, but Sunday evening. I want to tackle the, ne the subject next Sunday evening of evolution and just how far the Bible contradicts or supports or allows or disallows what is known as the theory of evolution. But may I finish tonight by saying this. The great difficulty with talking about the creation of the world is that nobody was there to see it. No scientist was there to examine it. No reporter was there to write it up for the press. No historian was there to record it for posterity. Nobody was there to see it. And therefore it behoves us to be humble in our attitude and to say whatever conclusion I come to, I still realize my mind may not have grasped the whole truth. But here's the exciting thing. If you're a Christian, you're going to see it all the next time. If you're a believer, you'll get the chance to see just how long he takes next time. Because the amazing truth which science would never have discovered and so far as I know no scientist has ever revealed is that God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. A new universe and you'll see it. And you'll know then how long he takes. Because you'll be around. How long will he take? The Bible doesn't say. There is no time mentioned for the new creation except for one part of it. And we are told how long God will take to make one part of the new universe. What part? My new body. Because if I'm going to live in a new universe, I can't take this old body with me. It'll die, it's diseased, it's tired, it's weak. I'll need a new body and I'm going to have one. One of the most thrilling things to me is that I'll be able to shake hands with you in the new universe. Heaven is as real as that. It's a place, not a state. I go to prepare a place for you. A new heaven and a new earth will be a place, a new universe. Oh, the beauty of this one's marvelous, as our prayer reminded us earlier. But what will the new one be like? Thrilling. How long will it take God to develop my new body? Six billion years? Six thousand years? Six hundred years? Six years? Six months? Six weeks? No, six days? No, six hours? No. Six minutes? No. Six seconds? No. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's how long it will take God to make a new body for me. 
The real question I want to ask, for it is the real issue, and I've discussed very frankly and freely with you the various viewpoints on those six days. The real question is not, did God create the world in six days, but could God create the world in six days? That's the big issue. And my answer to that is, yes, he could have created it in six seconds, because God is an almighty creator. And the God who can make a new body for me in the twinkling of an eye could make a new universe in less than that. So that you see, this is the real issue. It's whether you believe in a God who's almighty. It's not whether we believe God did a thing. It's whether we believe he could. And I find so often those who argue with Genesis and the early chapters are really saying, I don't believe that God could. And that's not what a Christian says. I believe most firmly, and this may seem to contradict all I've said tonight, but I believe most firmly that God could have created the whole universe in six days. And in six hours and in six minutes. One day I'll tell you how long he takes to make the next one. Because one day it is my Christian hope to have a body that will never be diseased a body that will never die, and to live in a universe in which there are no tornadoes and no bacteria and no cancer and no leprosy, to live in a world in which there's no sin either, to live in a world in which there's nothing that spoils this universe. When it left God's hands, however long it took, when it left God's hands, God said, that's very good. And into that world came evil, both human and superhuman, and ruined it. But God says, I'm not finished with it yet. I'm going to try it all over again. I'm going to build it all over again. I'm going to dissolve this one in fire. And then I'm going to take all the energy again and rebuild it and make a new heaven and a new earth. How long will God take? I'll tell you when he does it. Hallelujah. Let us pray. O oh God, almighty creator, we set no limits to what you can do. And we pray that whatever conclusions our minds may come to in their search for intellectual satisfaction, that our hearts may come to that faith that is able to cry with your prophets of old, is anything too hard for the Lord. Grant us to believe that you are a God of miracle, a God of supernatural power, Grant us to believe that by your word you can take a life that is ruined and full of sin and hopeless and despairing and in a moment recreate it. Make a new man, a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Lord, we know this happened to us if we believe. And so we have faith. And we look forward to the day when you not only make new men spiritually but give us new bodies to match our new spirits. And give us a new earth in which our new bodies can live. And a new heaven in which we may move as freely as Christ moved in his glorious body when he ascended to heaven. Lord, we look forward to traveling in space in those new bodies. And seeing the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. The city whose builder and maker is God. Help us to realize these things. Stretch our imagination, deepen our faith. And help us from the discussion we've had together tonight to see more of the truth, and to know the truth that sets us free. For Jesus' sake, amen.